on Wednesday, one week from today. The test will be in here. If you look back at the old test, it'll look like those. The questions will be different, but they'll be similar too. So that's a good place for you to practice. It'll be about 15 multiple choice, about four to six free response. The free response make up more of the credit. So even though they come in the second half of the test, you really should spend most of your time focusing on those because they make up about 70% of your total score. So uh, a lot of weight on the free response. As you're practicing, just um, be aware that, that I do get partial credit for the free response. It's not all or nothing. So if you write something that's right, you'll get something. If you write nothing, that's real easy for me to grade because that's you know all the points off. But if you write something that's close to right, you'll at least get some points. So keep that in mind as you're practicing for the test. I recommend that you print out the test. Going back, oh gosh. If you go back too far, the tests are going to be kind of different. But I would go back to say, um, where are they? Hey, Connor. Maybe fall 08 or maybe to fall 2010 where I, you start getting solutions. So you have, you know, six, six semesters worth of exams. And uh, also notice that not all the material that you have on every exam one will be on your exam. We're going to do chapter one and chapter two and maybe a portion of chapter three. So you might see material that's not, that we haven't covered. In which case, you know, know that that won't be on the exam. But I'll be more clear about that on Monday. Talk about what's going to be on the exam. Okay? Just sort of to remind you, though, to review. You know, in Chapter 1, we had our standards. Just to sort of jog your memory. And hopefully you've already mastered these things. You know all the standards. You know what makes a good standard, all that business. Good morning, ladies. Um, we had conversion of units. We had dimensional analysis. That's where we had the equations and we put in the units trying to figure out what the dimensions are. We had significant figures. That'll probably be in multiple choice questions. Uh, trig and calculus review. You might see one simple question where I ask you the angle in a triangle or I ask you uh, what is the derivative of this function. You're not going to see chain rule. Hey, John. You're not going to see chain rule. You're not going to see uh, derivatives or integrals of trigonometric functions. That'll come later, but not right now. Um, also from chapter one, you need to know your metric prefixes. Not going to have a question about that, but embedded within questions, you'll have to convert units to the proper units. So just make sure you know your metric prefixes. You're going to have an estimation problem. So that's all the stuff from Chapter 1. Again, on Monday, we'll spend a little bit of time reviewing those as well, and I'll answer any questions that you have about that material. Homework's a good place for you to practice, okay? You'll see uh, some of that stuff, s uh, questions that are similar on the exam. For the 1D motion chapter, that's Chapter 2. You're going to need to analyze graphs like we've done. You're going to need to deal with functions. And we'll work one like that where I give you a function for position and I ask you for velocity and acceleration and ask you to describe that motion. You'll need to uh, create qualitative graphs. I'll just call it qualitative. Those of you that are doing the lab this week on video motion, on video in the motion, I know not all of you have done it, not all of you are in the lab, but similar to that stuff. And we've done that here as well. And we'll see some more of that today in the concept test. Uh, and then you'll also have kinematics problems. You have some of those in the homework, in the old test. Those are problems like, you know, a car is traveling down the road at 40 miles an hour. How far does it travel in 10 seconds? That sort of business. So look in the homework and look at the old exams and some of the examples that will work in class as well. Okay? All these are 1D. We might get into vectors. Uh, I'll have to see on Monday. We'll see where we stand. Any questions about the exam? What to think about it? How to feel about it? All right. I don't want to scare you. I do want to scare you a little bit um, so that you, you're prepared. All right. Let's, um, I'm going to clear this out.
Um, let's come back to this. Where did we leave off here? We did all this stuff. Does anybody know? Do you know the particular number? These are in the back of your workbook, by the way. Did we do this one? We did not. We, we did this previous one, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure we did. All right. So you drive for 30 minutes. Oh, and by the way, guys, we do use AA for your frequency. Just want to make sure that y'all are on the right frequency. That is your default. So if you've never changed it, that is the frequency. If you have one of the new ones with the LCD screen, it should tell you the frequency when you turn it on. All right. Uh, you drive for 30 minutes at 30 miles an hour, and then for another 30 minutes at 50 miles an hour, what is your average speed for the whole trip? Remember, average speed is just distance over time. The total distance traveled divided by the total time. All right. Is it turning up pretty good? So the question here is, I'm driving 30 miles an hour and then 50 miles an hour. The average of those two, 30 plus 50 divided by 2, is equal to 40. So is it equal to the average of those two values? Or is it more than that average? Or is it less than that average? Traveling at 30 miles an hour for some amount of time and 50 miles an hour at some amount of time. A couple different ways you can think about this. I'm going to stop at 55, 55. Okay, good. B is the right answer. Uh, B is the right answer because I'm traveling at the same amount of time for each of the two speeds. So I'm traveling for 30 minutes at 30 and 30 minutes at 50. And so if I'm traveling the same amount of time, I can just average those two values together and get the average velocity. But if you don't believe that, you can, you can calculate the average speed. That average speed is equal to x over t. The total distance traveled 30 minutes at 30 miles an hour. That would be 15 miles. 30 minutes at 50 miles an hour. That would be 25 miles divided by 30 or rather a half plus a half, or one hour, 30 minutes plus 30 minutes, and then that gives you 40 miles per hour. But it's key here is that they're traveling the same amount of time at the two different speeds, so you can just average them together. All right, let's try this one. This one's similar but a little bit different. You drive 40, or excuse me, four miles at 30 miles an hour, and then another four miles at 50 miles an hour. What is the average speed for the whole eight-mile trip? This one's different because you're not traveling the same amount of time, you're, but you're traveling the same distance at these different speeds. So is it equal to 40, which is the average of 30 and 50? Is it more or less than 40? I'll stop at one minute, one minute. You can ask your neighbor what you like. You're all sort of all over the board right now as to what you think the answer is. I'll stop at 105. Okay, we know uh, you should be able to reason that the previous one, it was equal to 40 because they have the same amount of time. So since they're not traveling it for the same amount of time, these distances, you might think, well, it's not going to be this one. It's going to be one of the others. For which speed are they traveling the longer amount of time? The fast speed or the slow speed? Think about that. Don't answer right away. But which speed are they traveling the longer amount of time? The fast speed or the slow speed? And then let's try that again because the one that you're traveling the longer amount of time is going to skew the average towards that value. 
whether it be bigger or smaller than 40. So which speed are they traveling for the longer amount of time? It's not going to be B. It's either A or C. And you want to ask yourself, which speed, 30 or 50, am I traveling for the longer amount of time? And I'll stop at 30 seconds. Okay, that's awesome. C is right. Uh, because I'm traveling uh, for a longer amount of time at 30 miles an hour, then I my average is going to be less than 40. If you want, you can go through and figure this out. You can figure out the time for this four-mile period, and then the time for this four-mile period, and then take eight miles and divide by that time. But you don't really have to go through all that. By the way, these, t these concept test questions are a good place for you to practice for the multiple choice part. The questions aren't going to be just like these, but I do often go through and I say, well, that's a pretty good question. I'll take it and sort of change the wording a bit, ask the same idea. So the way I recommend is that you, you study these questions for the multiple choice as well as the multiple choice from the, other t the old test. All right, if the velocity of the car is non-zero, can the acceleration of the car be zero? All right, I'll stop at 30, stopping at 30. Okay, good. A is right. I can have the velocity of the car be non-zero. That means the car is moving, uh, but the acceleration be zero. If the acceleration is zero, what's happening to the velocity? It's remaining the same, or it's constant. So certainly that's possible. Anytime you're traveling along at, you know, 80 miles an hour, however fast you'll drive, that's going to be uh, filling the situation. Throwing a ball straight up, which of the following is true about its velocity and its acceleration at the highest point in its path? We haven't directly covered this yet, but I think you can probably reason it out, so let's answer, try answering it. I throw something straight up in the air, like this, and at the top of the path, tell me about its velocity and its acceleration. Are they both zero? Is the velocity not zero, or the acceleration not zero? Let me tell you, all about evenly split right now between A and C. So why don't you turn to a neighbor and tell them what you put. Tell them what you put. If they have something different, try to tell them what you put. It is either A or C. It's not B. Some of you have put B. A couple of you have put B, and it's not B. So it's either A or C. Do you tell Lazarus what you put? And do you tell Frankie? Frankie? Lazarus? Okay. Oh, that's not much better. Y'all still about split evenly. All right, I'm going to stop at uh, 128. You're willing to share your answer, but not change your answer. Is that right? All right. Uh, C is right. The velocity goes to zero, but the acceleration is not zero. What would happen if the acceleration went to zero at the top? It, the velocity would no longer change. So if the acceleration was zero, it would just stop up at the top, and it wouldn't come back down again. Because the acceleration has to always be constant in order for the velocity to change as the object goes up and down. We'll see that in just, in just a few minutes when we get into free fall. All right, we'll come back to this. All right, let's look at the one-dimensional motion. I will occasionally have you uh, derive things on the test. 
And so this is one of those times. I'll try not to do too many derivations. And sometimes I'll have you do derivations as take home. But in this case, I want you to know how to derive the equations of motion for the test. It's not a very difficult derivation. And it, it really just starts with a couple of simple definitions. This is the first definition, that A is equal to dV dt. That is our definition of acceleration that we had in the very beginning. Remember, this was the limit of the average acceleration as delta t gets really, really small to find the instantaneous acceleration. So I begin with this, and then I can solve that for dV, which is just going to be by cross multiplication, A dt. And then if I integrate both sides, I get the integral of A dt. And when I integrate, I have to go from an initial to a final condition. So I do ti to tf. Uh, I'm going to let ti here equal to 0. If I do the integral of A dt, here we're assuming that A is a constant. And so a constant, that you can't take the integral, of a, or we can just take the, inter the, uh, the A out of the integral. So I could rewrite this as A integral of dt from 0 to t. Well, we're just calling t f t now. Uh, what is the integral of dt? If you remember, the integral of A t to the n dt is equal to a t to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. So what is the integral of dt? What's implied here is that I have a t to the 0 here. So it would be like t to the 0 plus 1 divided by 0 plus 1. So my integral of dt is going to be equal to what? Just t, right. So then I can rewrite this as v equals a times t. Well, this becomes a times t. And then I have to evaluate it from 0 to t. That's going to be a times t minus a times 0. So that term just goes away. For the derivation, you could just sort of stop right here. Anytime you do an integral, some of y'all have had integral calculus, is that right? Calc 2? I mean, who's had Calc 2? Okay, just a couple of you. Uh, anytime you do an integral, you have what we call an integration constant. And so that's going to be plus c. This is an integration constant. An integration constant, that's what they call it in calculus. In physics, we would call it an initial condition. So this is our initial condition, and since we're talking about V, this is going to be our initial condition of V naught. So our equation is going to be equal to A times T plus my initial velocity, which is V naught. So that's one of our equations for kinematics. Uh, usually the way I'll write this is V equals V naught plus AT. So I'll write the V naught first. The next equation comes from this. This is our definition for velocity, that v is equal to dx dt. In the same way, I can say that dx is equal to v times dt. I can integrate both sides, the integral. And now I'm going to substitute here v naught plus at. times dt. What I've done is I've started with the definition of v. I solved this for dx because I want to get to an expression for x. And so I solved it for x, which is the position. I do the integral of both sides to get rid of these differentials. I substitute what I had before from the previous derivation here. And then I take the integral. Right? The integral of dx is just x. The integral of v naught is going to be v naught times t. And then what is going to be the integral of a t? Right, so I, I have a t to the 1 
So I add 1 to the exponent and then divide by that value. So this becomes t squared divided by 2. So I get a v naught t plus 1 half a t squared. And then I also have to add my integration constant. And that is going to be our initial position, our x naught. I'd rewrite this as x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. Almost always x naught, that initial position, is going to be equal to zero because we set where our coordinate system is, and I can set x naught to be whatever I want it to be. So almost always my initial position will be zero. Uh, I don't know that you'll really encounter a situation in this class where it's not zero. But maybe in other classes, you might you might find that to be true, where x naught is not zero. But because it's almost always zero, I'll usually just write this like this. This x is equal to v naught t plus one half a t squared. And so that's just assuming that my x naught is equal to zero. And then I have the other one, v equals v naught plus a t. All right. These are the two kinematics equations. You'll need them for the test next Wednesday. You'll need to know them. There aren't many equations in this first few chapters. When we get into chapter five, then we'll start having more equations. And at that point, I'll give you an equation sheet. But right now, you really just have this. I mean, we have the trig functions and all that, but that's just sort of something that, you know, you need to know that anyway, just, you know, to live or whatever. Like you need to know the trig functions. But these are really the only equations that you need to memorize. So do what you need to do to memorize them. You know, put them on an index card and tape them somewhere that you look a lot, above your kitchen sink, on your bathroom mirror, wherever. And then uh, you'll know them before the test. Okay? Don't write them on your hand for the test. You can write them on the hand today, and then you have them in front of you, but not for the test. Okay? It's a little complicated. <laughs> All right. Uh, know how to derive this, too, for the test. I'm not saying that it's definitely going to be on the test, but it could be. I could ask you that derivation. Once you look at it, after a little bit, it becomes pretty simple. You're just beginning with the two definitions for V and uh, for A and V, and you do the integral for each, substituting that value for V for, for uh, this one. Okay. Y'all good on that derivation? I don't want to ask you to memorize many der derivations, but this is one that that's, I don't know, maybe not useful, but it's, it's kind of cool. All right? Newton did this. All right, there's a third equation. I just give it to you because if you're pre-med or whatever, some sort of pre-something or another that has a physics standardized test, it's useful for you to know it. So if you are pre-med, you just need to know this equation. Not for this class, but... Uh, v equals v naught squared plus 2a delta x. Uh, this comes about by substituting one of those previous equations in for the other, and then you work, you find this equation. No need to memorize this. You don't really need it. Uh, but if you are pre-med, you should probably memorize it. All right, let's try this quick test. Um, I'm going to leave a couple things out of this because this is really a 2D motion problem. So I'm going to leave part B out. Yeah, we're just going to work parts A and C. A and A and C. So go ahead, and I give you the function for x, or actually the position. I'll write it in case you don't have your workbook yet. I think most of you have it now. But it's uh, 3.4t in the i direction plus 5.6t minus 4.9t squared in the j direction. Just a little bit about this, though. Um, this is vector notation. We're going to see this in Chapter 3, but I'll go ahead and introduce it here. This i and j are just letters for x, the x direction and the y direction. We'll also see a third vector soon, the k direction, which is the z direction. So this is what we call a unit vector. It just says in the x direction. It has a value equal to 1, and it denotes a direction in the x direction. So this describes the motion in the x direction, and this function describes the motion in the y direction. 
What I want you to do right now is to develop equations or functions that describe the velocity and acceleration in the x and the y direction. So you'll be doing those separately. Uh, find the functions for the particle's velocity and the acceleration in the x and y directions. And then when you do that, you can create your velocity versus time graphs for the x velocity and the y velocity. Everybody have the workbook? I know you can't see it from back there if you don't. Charity, can you see it up there? Give you a couple minutes to write those functions. You're just doing the derivatives, and then I'll jump in there. You should have a function for vx, a function for vy, a function for ax, and a function for ay. Is the x value, the x component. This is the y component. Let's look at the x. What is my function for vx? What is the function here? I want to venture the answer. Okay, what I'm asking is, what is the derivative of this function? What is the derivative of this function with respect to t? 3.4. So that is the function for vx. My value for Vx is going to be 3.4 meters per second. Now try doing that for Vy as well, and then go ahead and find the functions for Ax and Ay. What is Ax? It's zero because Ax is the derivative of Vx. And since Vx is a constant, that means it doesn't change. This is going to equal to zero. So there's no acceleration in the x direction. What is the function for Vy? Vy. That's going to be the derivative of this. So it's going to be 5.6 minus 9.8t. That's awesome. So Vy, taking the derivative of this function, is going to be 5.6 minus 2 times 4.9. That's equal to 9.8 times t to the 2 minus 1. So it's just t. And then the acceleration in the y direction here is going to be the derivative of this function. And so that acceleration, and everybody says, negative 9.8. It has a constant acceleration. Almost always we'll have a constant acceleration. It doesn't change with time. OK, so that is our functions that describe the velocity in the x and y directions and the acceleration in the x and y directions. This will be projectile motion, which we'll do in Chapter 3, but it's still relevant here. Now, I want to be able to plot Vx 
and dy make plots of those graphs. Okay, make plots of that. And you, you'll need to do this. You'll certainly see this question. Like, I'll give you some scenario, and then I'll say, sketch the velocity versus time function for this scenario. So think about what is happening here and what should happen on these vx and dy plots. These are with regards to time. Think about, do these plots have a positive, negative, or zero slope? What quadrant do they start and end in? Are the lines straight or curved? What about Vx? Is it going to have a positive, negative, or zero slope? Zero slope. That means it's going to be a horizontal line, and that line will have a value equal to 3.4, right, which was our velocity. So Vx is going to always have a value equal to 3.4. Right, Vy, what is it going to look like? Is it going to have a positive, negative, or zero slope? Negative, right. Because I have this equation, which is going to describe that. This is the equation of a line, right? y equals mx plus b. y equals m. This is our x variable. This is our b, our y-intercept. Okay, so it's going to have a negative slope. Where is it going to start? In the first or fourth quadrant? In the first quadrant up here. It's going to go like that. I want to point out here that something funky happens here. What happens at this position, what happens to the velocity? At this, this point in time, rather, what happens? Right, the velocity in the y direction equals zero. Here, the velocity equals 5.6. Uh, this is when you take something and you throw it up. That at the zero is at the top. And then it comes back down again. It has a negative velocity. And up here, it has a positive velocity. This is going up. This is coming down. All right, this is a little more difficult. Given these velocity functions, I want you to draw the x, the position functions for x and y. Given these velocity functions, what do the position functions look like? Remember, the slope of these graphs, the slope of these graphs are going to give you the value for these graphs. So whatever the slope is doing over here, it's the value of the slope is going to be represented here. So you want to ask yourself, is it positive, negative, or zero slope? What is the value for the slope? And is it uh, going to be in the first or fourth quadrant? about this first one? Positive, negative, or zero slope? Positive slope. What's going to be the value of the slope? It's always going to be 3.4. What the slope is doing over here is always going to be represented by the value over here. So my slope is going to be positive, and it's going to have a value equal to 3.4. That one's easy. Well, it's not easy, but it's easier than this next one. What about this next one? What is going to be happening to the slope? The slope will be changing. It's not going to be a straight line. And so you want to come over here and ask yourself, well, the slope is initially going to be big or small. It's initially going to be big, and then the slope will gradually decrease until it gets to zero, and then it's going to start getting big again. Is the slope of this graph, is it going to be positive or negative? The slope of the y versus t graph. Is it going to be positive or negative? That's a tricky question. Does that, what, what's the answer? It's going to be both, right. So it's going to be positive first, because it's positive right here. 
and then it's going to be negative here because I have a negative velocity. So gosh, what kind of function is that going to look like? It initially has a big positive slope. It goes to zero, and then it has a big negative slope. What's that going to look like? A parabola. Like upright, like this? The other way, right, an upside down parabola. And that's what it is, a quadratic function, that's a parabola. So this is going to look like this. Notice I have a big slope here, a big positive slope up here, slope equals zero. And over here, I have a big negative slope. All right, we'll see some more of those. Come on. Uh, well, let's see. Let's go back. How do we know? Can, do I know that? Yeah, I know it because looking back at the position function right here, the what's not written here is the initial y position because the initial y position is zero. Right, so that's how we know that. That's a good question. Okay, Are you, is that clear? All right. Um, uh, we'll come back to this. Let's work the problem. I'm going to show you a little video clip first. All right. So let's look at the winning car. That was which what was it? The Lamborghini. Right. So the white car, the white Lamborghini. Um, they gave the stats for how long it took. It was t equal 10.8 seconds, and the speed was 132.3 miles per hour. I went ahead and converted that to meters per second. It's uh, 59.14 meters per second. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I have four six pigs carrying them over. So that's kind of useful to know. So like next time you're on the road and you're doing 130 miles an hour, you can tell your friend, gosh, we're doing like almost 60 meters per second. We're flying. It's good to do those unit conversions. Like your friends will be really impressed. Um, our speed and then our distance. What was the distance for this? It was a quarter mile. I know what a quarter mile is. Right, about one lap around about 400 meters or 409 meters. Or no, not 409. 1609. Uh, 402.3 is our quarter mile. 402.3 meters. Okay, so that's the information that we have. What I want to know is what is the acceleration? All right, so when you encounter these problems, you want to write your equations off to the side. In fact, you know, you're going to get uh, like a, a bubble form. I sent an email out with the bubble form instructions. I don't know if all of you watched it. Those of you in the lab used it. But you're going to have a bubble form for lab or for the exam. And so you can write the equations on there as soon as you get it. But I always just like to write them off to the side. X equals V naught T plus one half a t squared, and then v is equal to v naught plus a times t. A lot of these problems are just really being able to read the problem and pick out the information that you know, being able to figure out what you don't know but what you need to know, and then using the appropriate equations to find that. I mean, that sounds simple, but it can be a little more complicated because a lot of the information that you know might not be stated. And so you'll need to have a little practice in figuring out what it is that you know but that's not stated in the problem. And I'll show you some hints and tricks for that. But here, everything is basically given. My time, my maximum speed, my distance, and I want to know the acceleration. Oh, there's something else here that's not written. What is that? The initial velocity, right. So my initial velocity is not always, but usually equal to zero. And then we look at what are values that we know and what are values that we don't know. And over here, let's see, I know x, I know v naught, I know t, I know t. So I could use this equation. Or I know v, v naught, and t. I can use either one of these equations. So this was a pretty simple problem. It's just very easy to solve algebraically. Let's use this bottom equation. I'm going to say v equals v naught plus a t. This cancels out. It just goes to zero. Uh, 59, I'm solving for A, is going to be V over T equals 59.14 divided by 
10.8 excuse me, seconds. And then that gives us our acceleration of 5.48 meters per second squared. So, if I were to plot V versus T for this, what would it look like? If I were to plot my velocity versus time graph for this motion, what would it look like? Would it be a curved or a straight line? It's going to be a straight line. That straight line can either have a positive, negative, or zero slope. Which is it going to be? For my V versus T, remember the slope of the V versus T gives us the, which one is it? The V versus T gives us the acceleration. So it's going to have a positive, negative, or zero slope. Positive, because that's what the acceleration is. The acceleration is positive. So I'm going to have a graph that starts at V equals zero, because V naught equals zero, and goes up like that. And the slope of this line will equal to 5.48. Alright, now let's say that I want to know the distance. If I had a graph of V versus T and I wanted to find the distance, how would I find the distance? I wanted to find the distance. Or you can do two things to a graph. You can find its slope or you can find its area. If I want to find the distance, what am I going to do? The slope or the area? Area. We'll work through some problems and in the old test you'll see some problems like that. But if I wanted to find the distance traveled, I would find the area. Let's find the area of this graph. I'm going to do that by saying x equals v naught t plus one half a t squared. Uh, v naught is zero. What I'm doing here is I'm just calculating the distance. I know it to be a quarter mile. Well, y'all just bear with me. Let's see what happens when we determine the distance. And we'll see that there's some discontinuity in the answers and try to figure out what the problem is. So what is this? Since V naught is zero, this whole thing goes away. And this left with one half A, which we found to be 5.48 times T, which is given as 10.8 seconds squared. And that gives us a value equal to 319.6. So what that's saying is, is that this area under this graph is equal to 319.6 meters. But I know that my car actually traveled not 319, but, you know, 80-some-odd meters more than this. So what gives here? Why do I calculate a distance that's less than the actual distance? What have I made an assumption about in this problem that's incorrect for these cars? I'll think for just a second. What, what assumption have we made here that is incorrect for these cars? Why is this not? consistent. Why am I getting a distance that's shorter than the actual distance that's traveled? Now, the initial velocity is definitely zero. That's a good guess, but yeah, the initial velocity is, is definitely zero. Huh? Car stopped accelerating. What I've, what I've assumed here, or what we've assumed, is that the acceleration is always the same. We've assumed that this is a straight line. Right, how would the curve have to be in order to give us a greater distance? Would it come below the line, or would it come above the line? Above the line. Because if you draw the, the V versus T graph above the line, like this, then you get a bigger area. And this area is 402 point whatever it is, 3 meters. And that makes sense. We'll see this in Chapter 5, that cars are able to accelerate faster at slower speeds, but as they get to faster and faster speeds, they can't accelerate at the same rate. It just takes a lot more energy to make a car move at faster speeds uh, because of the way energy works. We'll see that in Chapter 5 or 6. Okay?
be able to work with these equations, but then also be able to take that motion and translate it into a uh, into a graphical scenario. Have I told y'all that y'all are groundbreaking with these graphs? Did I tell y'all this? Like you're hundreds of years in the future. Oh uh, no, you're not hundreds of years in the past with the graph. It, it's it's not a little thing. All right, let's uh, look at freely falling objects. So with a freely falling object, that is something that I just have that's falling within the Earth's magnetic field. It's always going to have the same acceleration. That acceleration is due to the gravitational field. We're going to study all about gravitational fields in semester two, and you're going to be sick of them. But they're going to be kind of cool, actually, stuff that you've never seen before. But right now, we're just taking the gravitational acceleration as sort of a black box. Uh, the magnitude of the acceleration is equal to 10 meters per second squared. You might have seen g as equal to 9.8 in other classes, but we're just going to round that off to 10. It just makes the math a lot easier. And you know, that's 0.2, right? So we'll just make it the math easier. Uh, the way we usually do this, just as notation, is we'll write g as positive 10. This is uh, like the Earth's gravitational field is equal to positive 10. But when we talk about the acceleration, then that acceleration is going to be equal to the negative of that. So the acceleration due to gravity is negative g, which is negative 10 meters per second squared. That's just sort of a notation. So I won't ever write g until we get to chapter 4. Uh, for now, I'll use a, which is the acceleration due to gravity. If that doesn't make any sense to you, don't sweat it. Just know that when something falls, the acceleration is equal to minus 10. And it'll make sense later. So in free fall problems, we have several properties. Let's consider that I have a ball that I throw up. It goes up and then comes back down. We have several things that are true here. First of all, some of these things we've already seen. The velocity at the top is equal to zero. The acceleration here is equal to minus 10 meters per second squared. Remember that rule? If the velocity is up and it's slowing down, the acceleration is opposite the direction of the velocity. And that's true here. It's going up, it's slowing down, so the acceleration is negative. And over here, the acceleration, let's see, it's coming down, it's speeding up, so the acceleration is equal to positive 10 meters per second squared. Is that right? No, that's not right. Okay. It's actually equal to negative 10. The acceleration is always equal to negative 10 whenever we're near the Earth, whenever we're within the Earth's gravitational field, right, whenever we're near the Earth. So the acceleration both going up and coming down is going to be the same. Um, because it's the same, the time to go up is equal to the time required to come down. Right, somebody have a watch or something? Y'all time this. Time the time to go up and down. Y'all ready? Y'all get that? Who, who is our timer? Did you time it, maybe? No, okay. Which is, trust me, the time to go up is the same as the time to come down. The time required to go up is the same as the time required to come down. Uh, I think that's, oh, one other thing. We have a velocity here. This is V naught. It is equal to this velocity. So V is equal to the negative of V naught. That's only if these are at the same position. But that velocity, those velocities are equal. It goes up, the velocity decreases, decreases, decreases to zero, and then it comes back down. Remember, we drew this graph earlier, the V versus T, and it looked like this. This value is equal to this value. This is a, an object that you're dropping. All right, so several things here. Lots of different ideas. Velocity at the top is equal to zero. That'll be very important. The acceleration is always minus 10, and the time is symmetrical. So that the time up is required is the time down. And then also these velocities are equal right here. In fact, the velocities at, at similar positions are always going to be equal. So right here, for example, the velocity here is just the opposite of the velocity here. 
we'll use some of these tricks to solve problems when we get the problems. Uh, Seems like we're to do those on Friday. Uh, hold on just a second. Let me take a quick look. Uh, so I'm thinking that we're not going to have any of Chapter 3 on this exam. On Monday, we might have a little time to venture into Chapter 3 just a little bit, but it's going to be so new to y'all that we just won't have it. Even though the beginning of Chapter 3 is easy, we're not going to have it on the exam. So you need to master Chapters 1 and 2 for the exam next Wednesday. Okay? Y'all can do that. I know it's overwhelming some sometimes, but you can do it. Have a great day.